what it does not mean. What our purpose was and is and what our purpose is not. One can begin to understand what the state of Yehuda, Judea, is by beginning to understand the situation as it is now. Last week, Moshe Aaron, the foreign minister of Israel, speaking before the Knesset Committee on Foreign Affairs, told them, we need not adhere to long-held positions. We need not be stone walls. For that he was praised openly, profusely by Yossi Sarit. If Yossi Sarit praises you, you know you must be doing something wrong. And if the Jerusalem Post praises you, you had best sit back and say, where have I gone wrong? And if your name is Moshe Aaron, not only of Likud, but of Cherut, not only of Cherut, but of Betar, and that says a great deal about the glory that once was and is long since gone. Last Wednesday, Yitzhak Shamir appeared before soldiers in Shechem and he stated, there will be peace because we will find the compromise between what our heart wants and what our head tells us must be. And that is another tragic and not so subtle hint as to the readiness and the willingness of this government to compromise. When Yitzhak Shamir speaks about an international peace conference under the authors of the UN, you know that the beginning of the compromise is at hand. And when his top aide, Yossi Ben Aron, gets up and speaks of a confederation between Jordan, Palestine, and Israel, you know that we are in deep trouble. This is not Shimon Peres. This is the Likud. And when they speak about elections for mayors in Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, you know that compromise is before us. We are paying the price for 21 years of a failure to annex the territories. It is we who created a vacuum so that today we have no reason to blame the world. We have no reason to blame anyone except ourselves. Because we did not annex these areas, the world quite naturally assumes that there are two options. Either a Palestinian state, which is justice, or a continuation of what we have now, which is occupation. That's the natural, logical concept that emerges from the fact that we have not annexed these areas. If something belongs to you, you leap upon it and you shout, it is mine. You do not say autonomy. Autonomy means it's not yours, and if it's not yours, get out. You're a thief. We wonder why the world has positive feelings about the PLO. 
Let me tell you why. Because despite what they have done, the terror and the murder, they never compromised. They always said, it is ours. And when someone hears someone say, it is ours and I don't compromise, and the other party says, well, you take half and I'll take half, he says, that is the honest person, and that is the thief. We are paying the price for the fact that 21 years ago, with the immense mercies of a merciful God of Israel and the powerful armies of Israel, we rolled and swept through the territories and the world stood in amazement, in shock. And had we annexed the territories on that day, the world would have said nothing. But we feared, even then we feared the world. A people of little faith, a Jewish people that was once the people of the book, threw it away. Even then, even then, there was no faith. In 1967, when the Arabs of Calculia saw the Israeli army move in, they fled. They fled. The whole town fled. At, at that time, there were only 8,000 residents. The whole town fled. Calculia had been one of the most obscene centers of Arab terror. And for years, Jews had waited for vengeance. And the Arabs knew that. And they fled. They fled. They fled and they reached the Jordan. And Moshe Dayan, the Minister of Defense, sent the paratroopers to the Jordan to bring them back. Lest, God forbid, the world think that there was another Arab refugee wave. Already then, already then, I remember a number of years ago I was in Los Angeles and I met Pat Boone. Pat Boone is a fundamentalist Christian. I don't laugh. I wish that Jews believed as he believed. I wish that Jews believed in their faith as much as he believes in his faith. I wish that Jews believed in God the way he does. And he told me the following story, which is to our shame, to the shame of the Jewish people. He said, two weeks after the Six Day War, I flew to Israel. This is Boone speaking. And they took him to the Golan Heights. And he went there with Balib who was now the Minister of Police, at that time was the Assistant Chief of Staff. And Balev showed him, and only those people that were there at that time could appreciate the immense miracle of capturing that, that area in one day. Ring with fortification. There was only a one-track road, and the Israeli tanks could only go one at a time, and they were down below, and they had to go, go up. And the, and the Syrians were firing down at them. And they, and they took this in one day, in one day. And Boone said, said to me, I turned to Berlin, and I said, my God, it's a miracle. And he turned to me, and he said, what miracle? We have a great army. That's the tragedy. The Christian who became a Jew and the Jew who became a Christian. Moshe Dayan opposed the capture of the Golan Heights because the Russians had advisors there. And he said, 
If we kill Russians, then the Russians will, co will come in. The troops outran his orders. And Russians were killed. And the Russians didn't. And this tremendous fear. There always was a fear. What will the world say then? And so, we threw away this golden opportunity. And at that point, a policy was decided, a policy of no policy. We will neither annex nor give up land. And all we have to do is raise the economic standards of the Arabs on the West Bank, and they will be happy Arabs. It takes a certain kind of a mentality rooted in contempt for human beings to think that if we raise their living standards, they will become good Arabs. We became the Rudyard Kiplings of the 20th century. Lo, the poor native, and we shall raise him up, and then he shall be grateful on, unto us. The Intifada is the normal reaction of people who believe the land is theirs and who rise up against people that they assume to be conquerors and occupiers. And why are we shocked at the Intifada? What did we expect after 20 years of raising a generation of new Arabs? Their parents, illiterates, farmers, peasants, we gave them schooling. We took their children and we built universities, seven universities we built. Under Hussein there wasn't one university because he knows the Arabs because he's an Arab. He knew that the most dangerous Arabs of all would be the university graduates. And so there were no universities. Menachem Begin created the universities. In Hebron, in Bethlehem, in Shechem, in Beruzeit. And so, you had for the first time, intellectuals coming out. And the intellectuals are the revolutionaries. They are the revolutionaries. And so there is an intifada, which is now going into its 15th month. Every two weeks, Shamir comes out with a statement the Intifada Do'ich it's is dying out. A man of seventy three should be careful about talking about which is going to die out first. What dying out? We're dying out. What is he talking about? The chief of, of staff of Israel gets up and says we can't put down the Intifada because it has nationalist roots. Unbelievable. He should have been fired on the spot and sent back to his kibbutz. What do you think every Arab thought when he heard the chief of staff of the Israeli army stating, we can't put it down. Do you know what that meant to the Arabs? Do you know how the ground was laid by that statement for the death of how many more Jews? We can't put down the Intifada? Let me be the Minister of Defense for two days and you'll see how we put down the Intifada. <laughs> so what has happened because we have not annexed the area?
In the sight of the world, Israel is a thief, an occupier. And the Palestinians, uh, these poor people, are martyred, little children who are, are being killed. Because we have not occupied, because we have not annexed these areas, and said they are ours and they are now part of the state of Israel, the Intifada grows and grows, and Jews are afraid. Jews are afraid to drive today through their part of Herod's Israel. They're afraid. A taxi driver, two weeks ago, shot to death near Emmanuel. He died several times. He was killed several times. The first time he was killed by the Arabs who killed him. The second time he was killed by the army and the police that suddenly said, He has a criminal background and we're checking into the fact that he may have been killed by Jewish criminals. The outrage, the obscenity. And he was killed again when his family tried to put up a memorial for him. And the army came and ripped it down. Two weeks prior to that, near the settlement of Raha, another Jew was murdered. 32 years old, left a wife, three children, and the wife is pregnant with a fourth child. Whenever an incident takes place within the territories, the first thing the army does, the first thing is immediately go to the nearest Jewish settlements and seal off the settlements to make sure that no one comes out to take vengeance. That's the first step that is done. The rabbis tell us concerning the law and the Torah when someone finds a dead body in Eretz Israel, we don't know who the murderer is. And the Torah says that the elders of the nearest town must come out to the body and they must make a declaration. Our hands did not have a share in the shedding of his blood. And the rabbis ask, did anyone think that the elders had a share in the shedding of this blood? Why the declaration? And the answer, they declare, we did everything possible to ensure that this would not happen. You think that the government of Israel can make that statement? They have a share in the shedding of the blood of each and every Jew. So we come to the state of Judea. The land of Israel belongs to the Jewish people entirely and to no one else. That's the first point. Unto your seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river Euphrates. The promise of the Almighty to the first Jew, Abraham Avinu, Abraham. And the Ramban, one of the great, great commentators, says as follows. (laughs) Shenitztavenu, Noveshet Aretz, 
We were commanded to inherit the land that the Lord gave on, onto our forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and uh, Jacob. And not leave it in the hands of any of the nations. And this is what our rabbis call an, an obligatory war. An obligatory war. Not to give up an inch of territory onto the nations. That is the halacha. That is clear. The vacuum that has been filled, that has not been filled, is being filled today by the PLO. And so we declare, we do not want two Jewish states in the land of Israel. And we appeal to the state of Israel to annex the territories so that there will be no need for a second Jewish state. We do not want a second Jewish state. But, if the state of Israel will not annex these territories, despite the fact that we do not want two Jewish states, there will be a second Jewish state to ensure that there will never be even one Palestinian state. And this is the most concrete form of making it quite clear to the government of Israel. You will not be able, you will not be able to sign an accord with the Palestinians giving up parts of Israel. You will not be able to. This is not Sinai. Not Yamid. Here we're not dealing with two or three thousand people. Here you are speaking of sixty-five thousand settlers who live there, including a hundred thousand Jews who live right across the border, who will pour in into the area to ensure that it will not be given up, because they know that the day after a Palestinian state arises in Judea and Samaria, the next day the Palestinians will say, now to the next thing. We do not want a second Jewish state. But there will be a second Jewish state if that is what it takes to ensure that there will not be a Palestinian. And so last Wednesday, the first Zionist Congress for the state of Judea, was held. Originally it was meant to be held in Kirat Alba, near Hebron. But, because of pressure by the government and the army on the local council, they canceled a signed contract with us. And so it was held at the Sheraton Plaza in Jerusalem. The fact that they didn't cancel under pressure is probably the greatest proof of what a terrible tourist season this has been. <laughs> Over 600 people crowded into a room that held 450 people. A quarter of the settlements in Yudan, Sharmon, and, and Aza were represented. And this despite the fact that immediately upon the announcement that this conference, this Congress, would be held, immediately the Attorney General of Israel made a statement stating that he is looking into the question of whether this is mutiny and sedition. That deserves a certain special prize for chutzpah. 
the state of Israel refuses to declare the territories part of Israel. And then says that anyone who wants to make it part may be rebelling against Israel. That really takes a special kind of mind. The Bolshevik mentality. I don't know with whom he thought that he had dealings. He certainly didn't backpack away, you know, the last thing in the world. And we held it. And we challenged him. You want to come? Arrest us. We sent him a ticket. We created a special flag, which is right, right there. Deliberately, deliberately, similar in a way to the flag of Israel. So as to show that we want Israel to annex the areas. But if not, there will be a state, and this will be its flag. And in the flag you can see what will make the state of Judah different from the state of Israel. A menorah, a candelabra, representing Judaism. On the face of the lion, which was the symbol of the tribe of Judah. Zor Yehuda. There is the verse. Judah is a young lion. This state will not only be a state of Jews, it will be a Jewish state. We did not declare a state last Wednesday. We declared our intention to declare a state if and when Israel will leave the area. But what we did do, we elected a provisional assembly, provisional uh, committee, an executive committee, and we prepared to immediately begin the creation of the infrastructure of the state. A census is being taken now in all the areas. We're signing up people to become citizens. This is an identity card of the states of Yehuda. It's an identity card. People who become citizens will vote. And we are looking for an election within six months. An election in each and every settlement for the establishment of a permanent assembly, and a permanent executive. We have established shadow ministries, finance, education, and defense, and defense. We will not have any confrontation with the army of Israel. Never. There will be no confrontation with the army of Israel. We are not about to go to a civil war. A civil war is what the leftists want. We will not accommodate them. Just as when the British occupied the land of Israel, a shadow army called Haganah was formed. It was illegal, so the British said. But it was there. It was an infrastructure. It was there so that when the British left and the Arabs attacked from the Haganah came the army of Israel. That is exactly what we are doing in Yehuda. An infrastructure, weapons, training, not, God forbid, against Israel or its army. But should the army leave, there will be another army, another Jewish army, to meet the Arabs. The army of Israel is not in the territories to protect us from the Arabs. Far, far from it. They are there to protect the Arabs from the settlers.
If the army left and the settlers would be free to do what they wanted, you would see another Arab refugee swell into Jordan. The state is on its way not be proclaimed until God forbid there is a need for it. Time, tragically, is on the side of the states of Judea. Tragically. On the one hand, the Arab problem will grow and grow and grow thanks to the Jewish problem. Thanks to the Jewish problem. One sits in Israel and watches a country falling apart, committing suicide. Two weeks ago, at the Megiddo prison, the Megiddo prison, at the Megiddo junction, five miles from Afula in Israel, has in it several hundred Arab terrorists. And each week, the families, the relatives, come to visit them. And for the most part, things are passed quietly. Two weeks ago, along with the Arab families, came a group of Jews from a group known as Hala HaKibush, down with the occupation. And listen to the sickest story of many sick stories. As the Arab family stood quietly, the Jews unfurled banners and started calling the soldiers fascists and Nazis. And the Arabs looked at first with, with fear. <laughs> so they started calling them and Nazis. Why not? If the Jews show that it can be done, can the Arabs be far behind? And as the soldiers started to attempt to clear their way through, the Jews picked up rocks and started throwing it at the soldiers. And of course the Arabs saw it, and so they rioted. Every Friday, in every major city in Israel, the women in black come out. The women in black. They like Bush. Enough of the occupation. There is not one Arab in any Arab land who on any Friday or Saturday or Sunday or Monday comes out and says, let's have peace with Israel. There is no peace now movement in any Arab country. There is no movement that condemns its government for not wanting to have peace with the Jews. It is a specific Jewish sickness which tells a great deal about the psychopathic results of a galut, of an exile of 1900 years. We have become an abnormal people. Last month, at the rally of Peace Now, Tel Aviv, Dan Almagor, one of the leading entertainers of Israel, got up and said the following words. We had better, we had better prepare the glass cages in which we will sit when they put us on trial for what we have done to the Palestinians. What an obscenity! What an outrage! What a sick human being this is! A comparison to an Eichmann, to Nazis. What a sickness this person, this person is. And for all the Jews of Israel who are upset 
and said, how do you compare Jews to Nazis? That is how God punishes people who sat by quietly when they compared us to Nazis and were silent. God repays measure for measure. What how obscene it was to call the Kach movement Nazi. But who protested? Who said no? No one said, said no. They were repaid measure for measure. Suddenly Jews got up and called the army of Israel a Nazi army. What an obscenity, what a sickness. And how, unless we do something about this to end this, God forbid there will be no Israel left. A country which is moving towards civil war. Do you know how many Jews refuse to serve behind, beyond the uh, green line? We only hear either of people who are well known or people who want their case known. But the hundreds of others, anonymous people, faceless people, who come every day and say, I will not serve beyond the green line. And the army says, it's the Seder Gamur, you serve in Sfat. It's better not to have problems. Let's keep this in quiet. What we are seeing is the Vietnamization of Israel. But if in the Vietnam War, if the left was wrong, it was a mistake that was 8,000 miles away. If the left is wrong today in Israel about the territory, it is a tragedy that will sweep away Israel too. They're destroying our young people. As it is, the secular Sabra doesn't know who he is, and what he is, and where he is, and why he is. As it is, he's in this game. Never. No identity as to who he is. That's in the best of times. And now, on top of that, they take this poor fellow and tell him, you're a Nazi. You kill children. Yeshgvul, another group, there is a limit. There is a limit. Believe me, there is a limit. There is a limit. Hands out to all soldiers a booklet telling them how not to serve. This is what's happening today. We are poisoning the souls of our youth. Feeding them guilt and self-hate. It is a corrosive thing. It eats away their soul. For 40 years, Israel survived a tiny state in the midst of all these lions. It survived because it was certain that it was right. It was certain of, of the justice of its cause. And for the first time now, the justice of its cause is being questioned by other Jews. You cannot have an army fighting properly, strength, courage, if it is convinced that it is really wrong. And on top of everything else, they take a soldier, give him a gun, send him to Gaza, and then tell them you can't use the gun. There is a trial taking place now. Four soldiers in the crack unit give up. They killed an Arab. They killed an Arab. They're being they're on trial now because it's true that he threw rocks and he threw stones at them and seriously wounded one. But since he was running away, 
the act had ended, and therefore you can't kill it. This is the kind of convoluted thinking, polluted thinking, which puts Jews into prison and sends soldiers into a frustration. If I don't shoot, I may be killed. If I do shoot, I may go to jail. So the best thing is to back away slowly. And that's what the Arabs see. Soldiers backing away from them. That's what they see. And that's their courage then. And this, and, and this gives them confidence. And this makes soldiers sick and tired of being there. It's not the Labour Party's fault. Could members have this incredible incapacity to admit that the fault lies not in our parishes but in ourselves? The Prime Minister is not a Labour Party man. The Prime Minister is Shamir, a little man, a tiny vision. He is to blame for it. He has the right to fire the Minister of Defense. He can't get up and say, it's not my fault. Robin is the Minister of Defense. You fraud you. Fire him. But you won't fire him. Because you know that you are going to make concessions and you need the Labor Party. That's why they took in Paris. Paris was a A corpse. A political corpse. It was finished. And Shamir came and resurrected the dead. (laughs) Because he needed him. He knew that he was going to make the concessions. And he wanted someone to blame along with him. So he won't fire Rabin. Of course not. Last week, Ehud Ulmar, another one of the young princes of, of Likud, cabinet minister now, he got up on radio and said, I can't sleep next. I, I think of every day, soldiers killing out, and I can't sleep next. You can't sleep next? You can't sleep? You from Likud? If it bothers you that Arabs are being killed, make Kahana prime minister, I'll move the Arabs out of the country, and no Arabs will be killed. <laughs> and Ehud will sleep nights. <laughs> it is all part of a pattern preparing the ground for compromise. And for those who say, oh, don't never give up, you done Shimon. Yes. And if someone would have said that Menachem Begin would give up the Sinai, they would have said, you're insane. They gave up the Sinai, tore down Jewish settlements. The first time one eats Chazer, pork, it's difficult. The second time it's much easier. Yuda Lolam Teshev, a verse in the Tanakh, in the Bible. And Judea will exist forever. I hope it will never have to exist. But if it exists, it will exist forever as a Jewish state. We have not much time. We have very little time. The forces within Israel are moving Israel to surrender and to disaster. We are paying a price for all the years 
of not admitting that the PLO represents the Palestinians. Of course it represents the Palestinians. I said that for 18 years. Of course they represent the Palestinians. What are you playing games for? To whom are you lying? To yourselves? And what happened all these years when Israel said, we'll never meet with the PLO, but we will meet with Hussein. Do you know what they were doing by that? They were creating the myth that there are good Arabs and there are bad Arabs. There are modern Arabs and there are extremist Arabs. That's the most dangerous myth imaginable. There are no modern Arabs. Every one of them wants to wipe out Israel. But there are clever ones and stupid ones. Incredible. We won't speak with Arafat. If President Assad of Syria tomorrow morning said, let's sit down and talk, you think that they would speak with him? Of course they'd speak with him. Who's more dangerous, Assad or Arafat? Of course Assad is. For years I've said, meet with Arafat, of course meet with him, and tell him no. Meet with him. They're all murderers, all of them. We have a certain, uh, he's a modern murderer. He's an extremist murderer. They're all murderers. Meet with them and tell them no, not an inch. But if you'd like Jordan, we may help you. That's how you talk. Stop playing games here. We won't meet with We'll have an inter no international conference. Well, the opening will be a, an international one. But then everybody goes, goes home. What, what, what insanity is this? What insanity is this? You annex the territories. You make them part of Israel. You tell the, the uh, world, shut up and mind your own business. <laughs> what will they do? What will they do? Last Friday, the Kaf movement demonstrated at the U.S. Embassy in protest at the outrageous handling of the Intifada in Miami. It was an outrage. It was an out. They actually killed two people. It was an outrage. And they didn't even use plastic bullets. That's what you do with imagination. Instead of this deadly, dull hydra, this, this two-headed hydra. Paris and Shamir were the ever too dull people to lead a country in the world. Judea is on its way. Citizenship of the state is open to every Jew throughout the world. Every Jew. If you want to vote, you'll have to live in any part of Eretz Israel, including the states of Israel. But anyone can be a citizen, no matter where he or she lives. And it's important that we register as many citizens as possible. It's very, very important. It's an urgent matter. It's important that when people visit Israel, that when they enter the country, that before they show their U.S. passport, they first show passport of Judea. And of course, they'll say, what Mazer, what says to you, say, what do you mean? What do you mean? What, what, what's it? It's a passport. And they'll come and argue, oh, but it isn't good. And you argue, oh, good, argue oh, oh, for a while. Argue oh, for a while. And they'll bring the police, Mazer, what's over here? And just speak English. Never, never speak Hebrew with them. Only English. That they respect. And you know, you discuss and so on. And then afterwards, when things get a, a little warm, then you bring out the U.S. the U.S. passport. But let this be. We, we are applying tomorrow to the U.N. observer status at the U.N. And if we are turned down, we will we will appeal to the World Court in the in the Hague. Not the game. Every step that we take 
underlines and emphasizes again the sovereignty of Jews over that area. And we are the antidote to this terrible guilt and, and fear and, and complexes and, and self-hate. We, we're the antidote to that pride. Of course it's ours. No, they don't apologize for that. It's ours. It's ours. We've opened a consulate in Manhattan at 1180 Avenue of the Americas, on the ninth floor. To sign it, you'll see the, sign. the consulate of the state of Judea. You can pick up forms there to apply to become a citizen. Fill it out, send it in, or leave it there, and you'll get your citizenship card. And uh, we're now working on, on the first stamps. The famous artist Nachshon in Haron, in Kirk Arba, is making the first stamp, stamp for us. And uh, a state is on the way. A state is on the way. It took Herzl exactly 50 years. Hopefully, we'll never have to have one. But if we have to, it would be a lot less than 50 years. And it would be a lot more Jewish state than the one that hurts so many. I want to finish with just one statement, and one point. Among the tragedies of our time, not only the fact that the left speaks about land for peace, land for peace, but so many Orthodox Jews, so many Orthodox Jews speak about the concept that to save a life or to save lives, one must give up, give up land. It's important that we know what the Allah says, really and truly. Peace for land, land for peace. In the Bible we find one of the, one of the judges was called Yiftach. Yiftach Agiladi. Yiftach from Gilead. And he was the judge of his time. He was the great sage of his time. He was the Gadol of his time, as the rabbi say in the Talmud, Yiftach Yiftach in his time was as great as Samuel was in his time. Whoever lives in his time, and if he's the greatest one in his time, we don't say, well, had he lived in this and this time, he wouldn't have been the great. You don't compare time. So he was the judge. In the, and in the Bible, in the Bible, we find that in his time, the Ammonites, Ammon, declared war on Israel. They declared war on Israel. Israel. They fought with Israel. Yiftah hears this. He's the leader of his people. And he sends a messenger to the Ammonites. And he says, Malivalach, what's, what's the business over here? I mean, why a war? Why do you want to go to war? And Melech B'nai Amon, the king of, of the Ammonites, sends him back. And he says, because when the Jews left Egypt, you took my land. You took my land. The truth was that the land had been originally taken by Sicho, who went to war against the Jews. He went to war, and he lost, so he also lost his land. And the king of Ammon then ends with a moderate tone. Listen to how he's... Listen! He says, Vata, and now, Hashiva eten b'shalom. Give it back in peace. Shut, shut, peace. Give me the land, I'll give you peace. 
Peace now. Peace instantly. Peace immediately. Peace. Now you can imagine, outside of Yiftach's home, a hundred thousand peace now people. God said, land for peace, land for peace. Give them the land, we'll get peace. And what land are they talking about all over here? Chas v'shalom, they're not talking about Eitan Aviv. Chas v'shalom, God forbid. They're not even talking about the West Bank. Of course not. No one would even think of the West Bank. But he's talking about the East, ba- the East Bank. So a hundred thousand Jews now going to give up the East. Who needs the East Bank? We have the River Jordan as our defense. Perimeter. Give him the East Bank. You have to, don't be such an extremist. So Yiftach, the Gadol of his time, the great scholar of his time, sends back the following message to the king of Ammon. He says, listen, he says, Motik Tishma, listen. Habibi, listen to me, he says. You have a god named Chmosh. That was the god of uh, Amun. Hello, et asher yorishach mosh elohecha ototirash. Whatever your god Chmosh gives you, God bless. Oh, you. Et asher yorish asher elokeinu mipaneinu ototirash. And that which the Lord our God gave unto us that week. And he went to war. And he won the war. But he he went to war and didn't say land for peace and pikuach nefesh to chashtachim and to save a life and pick up land. Why didn't he? Why didn't he? Because of what the Ramban said, which I quoted to you earlier. That not give me a land the zui she achachamim or inota milchemet mitzvah, and this is what our our rabbis tell us is called an obligatory war. Within the halacha, there is a concept known as milchemet mitzvah, an obligatory war when one must go to war. The peace-loving Jewish people have a mitzvah, one of the six hundred and. 13 called Milchemet Mitzvah, when you must go to war. And the rabbis tell us, when is a Milchemet Mitzvah? And they say to us, a Milchemet Mitzvah is a war against the seven Canaanite nations, Amalek, and any time the enemy comes up against Israel. That is an, an obligatory war. So for all the rabbis that say when there's a danger to life you have to give up the mitzvah of keeping Israel. Because it's like Shabbos. Shabbos. If there's a danger to life you have to violate Shabbos. If there's a danger to life you have to violate the mitzvah of keeping land. Nice? Makes sense? Think. Think. Every mitzvah in the Torah, except one, every mitzvah is never dangerous. It's not dangerous to keep Shabbos. Usually. Therefore, if in a rare time it becomes dangerous to keep Shabbos, you are allowed to violate the the Shabbat that week so you can keep the Shabbat, you you can live and keep the Shabbat for years to come. That's the rationalization behind live, violate the mitzvah now so that you can keep it later. All the mitzvot have that concept. They are never dangerous, usually. Per se, they are never dangerous. So when circumstances make it dangerous now, you can violate it so as to keep it later. But there is one mitzvah in the whole Torah which is always dangerous. And that's a milchemet mitzvah, an obligatory war. Consider the logic in, in saying there is an obligation to go to war except if it's dangerous. 
If we suspended an obligatory war because it's dangerous, we would uproot that mitzvah forever and permanently from the Torah. And therefore, this is the one mitzvah because inherently it is dangerous. And nevertheless, God said, do it. It's the one mitzvah that the Minchat Chinuch, one of the great, great commentator says, Nehi, it is true. The Kula mitzvot mitchot tutei hasakana. It is true that all of the mitzvot are pushed aside because of danger. Nikol makom, nevertheless, mitzvah zu, this mitzvah of an obligatory war, a Torah tifta in chomi mahen, it commanded us to go fight with the yadu, and it is known the ha Torah lo tismuch dinim ames. God doesn't give us mitzvahs and say, do it and I'll perform miracles for you. God doesn't promise miracles. And by the nature of things. By the nature of things, people fall on both sides in the case of war. And nevertheless, God said, go to war. In king. Chazinan, therefore we see. The Torah gazra milchom imayem up to sakana. We see from here that the Torah commands us to go toward this even though there is danger. In kein dechuyas sakana. The makom is there. It is not the land which is pushed aside, but it is the danger that is pushed aside. And that is halacha. And that is the truth. And the tragedy is, how many rabbis know this? Prefer not to speak about it. Of course, it is easy not to say this. It is easier to say things that the congregation wants to hear. If we would have faith in God, we would have brought the Messiah years ago. If we would have the kind of faith in God that we have in George Bush, the Messiah would have come years ago. Unbelievable people the daily praise and says, Almighty God who is powerful and strong and mighty and can do everything, but we better give in to America because otherwise George Bush isn't going to help us. How many times have I said people that once believed in the burning bush now believes in the George. And what that says about the Jewish people and its descent from, from Sinai. How we have fallen. The Jewish people always, always goes with faith in God and a strong army. That's the Jew. That's the Jewish way. That's the Jewish way. And so, on the one hand, we have a Barlev who says, "Strong army we have." And God plays no part. And then there are all the Jews. Everything we shouldn't doubt him, but we don't need army. That's not the Jewish way either. Ramot Kel. A verse in Tehilim, in the Psalms. The praises of the Lord in their throats, faith, and a two-edged sword in their hand. That's the Jewish way. That was always the Jewish way. So let us have faith in God. And know that we are a special people and we are a chosen people and stop being ashamed of it and let us get rid of this insane hang of a box of racism. Uh,
question is, how does Gush Amunim stand vis-a-vis -vis the creation of the state of Judea? It has come out rather bitterly in opposition. In opposition. Now, members of Gush Amunim of course differ in great measure from their leaders. The problem is, and this is something which every Jew has to contemplate very, very carefully, even the most radical group runs the danger of becoming an established group. There is no longer any Gush Emunim. There is now an official body called Amanah. And their salaries are paid by the government. The moment you take salaries from the government, you're finished. You're finished. You're finished. Don't take money from them. Junkies, pushers, always are ready to give you the first shot free. And then when you need it, it's hard to break the hammer. And that's the tragedy. We invited every one of the Gush Emunim leaders, everyone, to take part in this thing. As leaders. As leaders of it. And they refused. Everyone, not one of the, not one of them showed up. A lot of Amcha, a lot of ordinary people showed up, but not the leaders. And that's a tragedy. That says so much. Ever, what are we doing if not trying to save them? But the difference is, but then our power will be eroded. This is the way it is. Our power will be eroded. Your power won't be eroded. Come on in and take it over. So the tragedy is, they have come out openly in opposition, and bitterly so, bitterly so, and, and have thus given immense comfort to the left. In Haaretz, they play in, in the uh, newspaper Haaretz, they played up on page one the attack of Rush and Munim on, on the state. Naturally, it's so. When did any leftists go and attack one of the anti war groups? Nobody attacks the anti war groups. Leftists, birds of a feather, stay together. Matsa minet mino, as they say. One, one form finds, finds the other one. With us, splits and divisions and so on, it's, it's a tremendous tragedy. But, I mean, you asked a good question, and you got an honest answer. A very painful answer for me, but an honest one. The rabbi mentioned the other time that the Catholic transfer of the Jews to the Jewish If they're worried about being killed out in America, let them come home to Israel. What are they talking about? There is a halakha. They shouldn't be here, period. All these rabbis. What are Arab states? There are no, there are few Jews left in the Arab states. In Morocco, there are Jews who stay there to make money. They can leave tomorrow morning. And where in Libya there are no Jews left? And where? There are no Jews left in Libya. The only Arab states which are in which in which Jews cannot 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 leave are in Iraq. Two hundred Jews Jews are elderly elderly people. They're not going to be be heard. They're going to be bought. If I were the prime minister, I would I would send messages to the Arab states. The hair of one Jew falls and you have no capital left. And that's... You think that I am going to go under because some rabbi in, in America is afraid of a pogrom? 
Let him pick himself up and his yeshiva and his synagogue and come home where he should be in the first place. Yes, Howard. Does the creation of the state of Judea affect your trying to get that answer to the It has nothing, nothing, nothing to do with it. It has nothing to do with my, with my chances of the, uh, in the, in the Knesset. This is a separate matter, which was, which was done purely on its own merits. Uh, as to my going back to the uh, uh, Knesset, well, as I mentioned the last time, we will, at the uh, proper time, when the Knesset election looms, change the change the name and uh, and see and see what ha- happens there. I'm not so sure that that's even relevant anymore. I, I want people to think carefully. Think carefully. What if we would have run in this election and gotten our ten seats? Who would have gotten our ten seats and been the third largest party? What would have happened? Well, what would happen is exactly what happened. Labor and the crew would have, would have gotten together in panic and this time kept it for four years again. Do you know what will happen to Israel in four years? Do you know what they will do to the country in four years? In the end, unless we change the whole system, I don't know what it's going to be. Israel needs a strong government. Israel needs a government which is not riddled by tiny little people worrying about who will get the lotto seats. Unbelievable. 26 cabinet ministers. There are more cabinet ministers than there are opposition Knesset members. The U.S. has 250 million people. How many, ca- how many, how many, how many cabinet offices are there here? 10, 12, 13, 15. Israel has 26 cabinet ministers. They cut the pie up so, so that everybody will have a slice. There isn't even room at the minister's table in the Knesset for them all to sit together. Thank God most of them never show up. Your American citizenship status, and the second question: uh, uh, What's the relationship between the new administration that just came in, uh, Bush and Snowden, and the uh, uh, State Department, the new uh, head of the State Department, uh, and Israel, and your feeling about Judea? Mm-hmm. Let me answer your uh, uh, first question. My, uh, you know, citizenship status is still up in the air. Um, it's in the courts and uh, the trial has not yet been set or the hearing has not yet been, been set it, it will probably be sometime uh, in March in uh, federal district in district court in Washington D.C. until then I have problems entering this uh, country always I'm here on uh, Chesed now so that I can consult with my attorneys. Uh, it's not it's not an easy matter. There's no question that what is happening is that Israel's hand is in this. Because when I was fighting the U.S. government's effort four years ago, when they claimed that I had lost the U.S. citizenship, they ag- agreed without any problems that while the while, that while the case was being was being heard and, and adjudicated, I could enter the country. And suddenly now they said no. And there is a difference, and the difference is Israel. In any case, I'm here, and uh, please God, it'll be it'll uh, work out out well. And, and the second question, that's too, that's too complex a, a question. I, I have no idea what, you know, Bush, Sununu, and so on. I have no idea. But uh, as the Talmud says, respect him and suspect him. Yes. Yes, that's a, you're, you're right, that's a, that's a very, very, very definite, definite possibility. But in order to, 
in, in order for, for that to happen, the state of Israel would have to recognize the state of Judea. And that, and that would be worth, that would be worth it. That would be worth it. No, no, no. No, I think that, first of all, it's such an academic question. You would never recognize this state. Uh, would never recognize it. It, it, would, it would simply say there is no such state, and thus there is no such citizenship. But if they did, I'd be a very, very happy, happy man. Very happy. Yes, ma'am. Grand slam, there's the volume on it. Yeah, that's the best question. Yeah, it's, 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 it's the most common common question. And the you know question is is one asked by everybody. It's a very, very natural question on the part of Jews who have been so brainwashed by that Israel needs America, so what I mean, my God, what's what's gonna be? If I were George Bush sitting in, in this room now and I heard that question. That would be an invitation to me to pressure Israel. Every time America hears a Jew say, but what can we do without America? That's an invitation to pressure. Certainly. If I knew that, if I know that you're frightened of, of me, that's an invitation for me to come. Beat you up, push you around, steal from you. Of course, certainly. And it's an, an invitation, therefore, not only that if you do what I say, but it's an invitation knowing that you're so afraid. What do you do tomorrow morning if George Bush says, if Israel doesn't give up the territory, just let's leave aside Judea, Arabs, forget about that. Khan doesn't exist. If you don't give up the territory, you're not going to get money. What do you say? You know, give it up? You won't say that, right? You'll say no, right? Good. So if you can say no to him on, on that, say no to him on that. Thing. That's the first. Secondly, I'm sick and tired of, of hearing about this. We need America. The problem with, with Israel is it isn't a state. It's a shul. It's a shul. It walks on with a pushkin. American money, J.A., German, German reparations. What is, what, what is over here? What more what country lives off other, off other uh, people? The best thing in the world, Alavai, that we should have the resources that they have. Alavai. What normal country does that? A normal country learns to work hard. And if Jews worked as hard as Arabs worked, it would be a totally different ball game today. Jews have got to learn to work. And Jews have got to learn that Israel needs free enterprise, capitalism, private initiative. That, that's what Israel, Israel needs. There's billions of dollars out there waiting to pour into Israel if Israel will only say, come on in. There are wealthy Jews who pour billions into Singapore and into Taiwan and, and, and into Korea who would dearly love to give it to Israel. But Israel doesn't want it because private enterprise means that the Istadrut would have to be broken up. The bureaucrats would, would, would be broken up. And political power comes out of economic power. And so, as Shimon Peres and all the rest, the state can go under, but the party and our power stands over that. The best thing out that would ever happen to us would be if America cut off economic aid. We would then have to stand on our own feet. We would then have to have all these changes. Instead, we're a junkie getting its annual fix every single, single year. And so, we don't deal with the real issues, the real issues. And instead, we become dependent politically on America. And we, and we become dependent psychologically on America. We need America. We can't do that America. In our program, Burke Knesset, 
One of our planks was that we will ask America to phase out economic aid. We don't want it. And we will rip apart the, the, the uh, bureaucrats. I don't want the bureaucrats. No more red tapes and no more licenses and permits and permits to get licenses, licenses to get permits to get, to get licenses. Another nonsense. Let a person come in, invest, and make money. And build its factories, and give jobs, and have exports, and have foreign currency, and hard currency. That's what Israel needs. And that's what Israel will, will have, and that also is part of this new state. And above all, there is a God. And why do we what is wrong with us? What is wrong with us? That we who, who survived for 1900 years so irrationally don't understand that we survived because there is a God. And we've lost faith and, and, and we've lost so much that is basic to us. And finally, what in the world makes you think that if we throw out the Arabs that America Americans sit all day and they think nothing except Israel, Israel, Israel. Americans don't think all day about Israel. They think about the Super Bowl. They're not interested in Israel. What are you talking about? It's only Jews that sit thinking, what are you thinking about Israel? That's also part of a shtetl complex. As if we owe, a, what do we owe America? What do we owe America? America gives and America gets. America attacks us not because we're nice, you think that. Ronald Reagan backed, um, backed Israel because we're nice? Ronald Reagan backed Israel because his policy was to have a strong, stable, anti-Soviet ally in the Middle East. And there was only Israel. Who else is there except Israel? Libya? Jordan? Oh, blow it away. Lebanon? Which Lebanon? Which which Lebanon? Among Hezbollah, Shiites, Sunni, Jews, Christian coexistence? What? What Lebanon? What Jordan? Kuwait? Abu Dhabi? What allies have they got? The only strong, powerful, stable country there is Israel. But the problem is that Israel behaves like some shtetl beggar in Minsk. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I don't thank you for anything. You give, we give. You get, we get. That's called allies. That's called partners. And that's the way Jews have got to think. Perhaps you're right, but that's not that's not the answer. Aliyah is a is a major part of the answer. Certainly, of course, absolutely, absolutely. But if you think that Aliyah from this country to Israel, without a change in Israeli policy, is going to make things better, it's not so. It's not true. Indeed, one of the reasons why there is such a paucity of Aliyah is because a state which was once such a great, great dream is now a kind of a nightmare. Secondly, it's nice that you think that we should have Aliyah. Every Jew thinks we have Aliyah. We should have Aliyah. There is not one Jew of the six million that are living in this country that doesn't think it's a great idea for someone else. <laughs> of course I want Aliyah. I made Aliyah. I made Aliyah. I can talk about it. I made Aliyah. I took my family on Aliyah. And I have 14 grand grandchildren who, 
who were born there because, because, because of that. Of course I want Aliyah. How many rabbis are talking about Aliyah? How many Jewish leaders are talking about Aliyah? How many Zionist leaders are talking about Aliyah? You have Zionist leaders who have been Zionizing out of 515 Park Avenue now for 60 years. Of course I want Aliyah, but who's going on, on Aliyah and name me one case in Jewish history in which there was ever large-scale Aliyah from any affluent country? There never was. It's a tragedy. I agree with you. Of course there should be Aliyah. <coughs> Perhaps if there would be a different state. I, I don't mean Jerusalem, but if, if Israel would be a different kind of a state and a different kind of a government and a different form of and if it would be a more Jewish thing, then perhaps Jews would be, some Jews, I'm going to say, oh, far, 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 more, but certain Jews would be willing to give up a material life for something that is Jewish. But how many Jews sit now and say, why should I give up a good life to go to a country which isn't even Jewish? I mean, what am I getting there? Now, I don't want to give you an extra reason not to not to go, because, because I think that that argument is a false argument, it's a specious argument, and it's not an honest one either. It's simply used. Nevertheless, it is used. It is used. You don't go to Israel because it has a nice government. You go to Israel despite its government. You go to Israel because of a mitzvah of in Israel. Because it's your country and it's your home. And because no matter how difficult it, it, it will be in Israel, and it will be very, very difficult. It will nowhere approach the difficulty that is coming to the Jews in this country. Uh, hatred in this country, and I travel a lot and I come back and forth, so I can see it, is unbelievable. I have never in all my life seen as much open hatred of Jews as there is today. On every radio program I appear, a phone call. It's incredible. The cartoons that appear against Israel are out of strength. These are Nazi cartoons. Real hate. So people say Jackson is a threat. Jesse Jackson is not the threat. Of course he is a threat. He's not the, the threat. The ultimate threat to the Jews is not a black threat. It's a white threat. They're the majority. They have the power. And all those people that are sitting, that sat around yesterday watching the Super Bowl drinking, drinking beer. Well, when they have beer, they hate Jews quietly. And if you mortgage their beer and their TV set, and the economic crash crashes down on them, the hatred that is in them is going to come out in a horror. So of course, Aliyah, and having said all that, doesn't make any impression. Jews for a, a moment said, you know, he's right. And then the moment passed. Because it's hard. It's hard to do the right thing. It's hard. And secondly, if you have a Yavad, you can rush on and say, eh, who's Kahana? Every other rabbi says, it's okay to stay here. And that's true too. And that's true too. And that's probably the biggest tragedy of them all. Because if people can think back to the 1930s, how the overwhelming majority of rabbis in Poland told Jews not to go to Palestine, but to stay. And that was a tragedy. And we paid for that. Uh, we really can't have people talking. Here's a here's the MC, and he takes people's people's questions. I don't want Jews to have to again and again and again suffer the same thing again and again. Why is it that Jews can't learn a lesson after a while? How many how many how much suffering must we undergo before we finally realize? You know, maybe we should do this. What is wrong with them? Well, what do you think of what's going on with the U.S. chicken and the 
What do you want from the U.S. and the PLO? What do you expect from the U.S. and the PLO? Every week, Knesset members go to speak to the PLO, and you're worried about America? What are you worried about America for? America is doing what comes naturally for America. America is, is doing what Abbe, Abbe, Abbe even writes an op-ed piece in the New York Times telling America to force Israel for its own sake. Now, so what do you want from America? I have no complaints to America. There is no Gentile problem. There never was. There has always only been a Jewish problem. If the Jews would do the right thing, then Gentiles would also do the right thing. But if Shimon Peres gets up and, um, and, and with a real broad hint, please with George Schultz to force Israel into peace talks. What do you want from America? I have nothing against America. They are doing what comes naturally. I have things bad about, about Israel because everything it does is unnatural. What? I don't want to. I don't want to get into any language. A good shots. I. I don't want to get into that. That now. It's just these are these are parties that are not relevant to anything except the money for their institution. That's it. Sorry, pardon. Because I don't want to start a war. Have you ever fought in a war? Have you ever fought in a war? Okay, well, let me tell you. I have. What is the military reason not to kill the Arabs? That's right. That's right. There is no, there is no mitzvah to attack Syria. There is no mitzvah, there is no mitzvah necessarily for you to attack a country which has, which has a part of Eretz Israel. There is a prohibition against giving up land. There is nowhere that I have found any, any source in which it says that we in our times have to, have to attack and start a war for that. There may be. There may be. And if there is, and, and, and if the rabbis would, would come and say yes, then that's how it has to be. But as of now, there is a great difference between giving up land, which was taken in a war begun by the Arabs, and our starting, starting a war. And any time there is a, a doubt about the halakha, you have to be very, very careful about it. At least, I'm certainly careful about it. I know it, uh, what a war is. It is in our hands. What are you talking about? It is in our hands. What are you talking It is in our hands. You're right. So therefore, therefore, I would do everything possible to make sure that that would stop. But there's a difference between that and going into an area which is not in our hands and starting a war. Now, there may indeed be a commandment to also do that. If you show me where, some rabbi show me, uh, sh show me, show me where, then perhaps so. Perhaps you're right. I don't know. Yes, we have a question. Man of the black hat, and then you. Then. Well, first of all, there is no comparison possible. The South seceded from a country. Judea and Samaria 
are not part of Israel, because Israel does not want them to be part of us. There is no comparison between states which were officially part of a country, the USA, and seceded, and then the question arose of nullification. Can they succeed? Can they secede? Can they not? And the federal government said, no, they cannot to see, but everybody admitted that they had been, been part of America. The question was, could they secede? Well, there, there is no question of breaking away. They're not part of Israel. This is a vacuum there. Now, having said that, you can say, you're right. But nevertheless, what if the army goes in? Oh, now, that is the next question. Because anything's possible in, in Israel. We will not fight the Israeli army. And there's no need to. It will be an impossibility to drag away over 100,000 people. It is not possible. It's not possible. We will make Martin Luther King's tactics, we will hone it to a fine art. And it's not the Sinai, which was far, far away. Judea and Samaria are surrounded by Israel, by Jews living in Israel. In Israel, who were pouring from the north and the west and the south. It's a very, very, very diff different thing, and that's why the government of Israel is so, is so worried about this. But we will never, ever fight other Jews. Never. Yes, sir, then. I'm sorry, pardon? Yes. I'm not so sure. I would also like to stand and applaud and feel good. But I think you're wrong. I think you're wrong. I think that thanks to the Jewish, that I think that the overwhelming numbers of Jewish leaders in this country, what is absent? It's a small group. And what's APAC? Part of APAC is hardly any hawk, hawkish group. And I'm not so happy about APAC, which is run by Tom Dine, who's married to someone who's not, who's not Jewish. That doesn't mean very much. I'm not a nationalist. And I'll say that to you openly. A nationalist? What makes me proud of being a Jew, if not Judaism? Albert Einstein? Sabin? We won another Nobel Prize? I think that the overwhelming majority, overwhelming majority of Jewish youth in this country not only are not hawks, they're not Jewish. They're not Jewish. They couldn't care less about doves, hawks. They don't feel Jewish. They care about Israel like they feel about Portugal. That's the far greater problem than Rita Hauser. The assimilation on campuses, to me, is a far greater danger than Rita Hauser. 
Tom dying to me is a far greater danger to the Jewish people than, than uh, Rita Hauser. Not that I, not that I, I love Hauser. Of course not. Would you pick a Tom, Tom Dine? No. Because to you, Tom Dine is a nationalist. Ochamvei, as they say. I don't care who this Tom Dine is married to. I will go to the ATAC conference and I will say, how can we talk about a secure strategic ally when we are asking you to bring this up? Okay? The point is, it's not Jews in America who are not Orthodox, okay? But still want to fight for this country. I'm, I'm not Jews. talking about Orthodox. I'm not asking you to be an Orthodox Jew yet. Wait a while. But, I'm, but what I'm asking you is to recognize the enemy. No, well, you don't know who you are. You think that Tom Dine is not your enemy. Not every enemy is a bad guy. That's fine. That's a... The subtleties and the nuances, Jews can die in two ways. Through the chimneys of Auschwitz and through the marriages with non-Jews. And understand that. And if you don't grasp that, then what are you grasping? If Adolf Hitler had not come up, do you know what was happening to German Jewry without Hitler? Assimilated, leaving everything Jewish. Would that have bothered you if Hitler had not been around? You know what's going on in Sioux City, Iowa now, in terms of assimilation? You know what's going on in, in Berkeley today? Doesn't that bother you? If it doesn't bother you, you need a strong lesson in what is Jewishness. There is no need for a Jewish people to, to exist unless that Jewish people is a special people. That's, if your great-grandfather would be, would be sitting here, he would turn to him and say, I don't know what your name is, Velva, Velva, you say, I am Velva. What you don't understand. That's the problem. And you're a good Jew. And I believe that really. I really do. And I think that Tom Dine, in his ways, a good Jew. He doesn't understand. He's a victim. He's a victim. It's a tragedy. We Jews have got to fight to save our bodies and our souls. And I agree with you that we should fight those people who in the 1930s and 1940s did with you. Right, no question about it. I founded JDL, and I never asked that you had worked on Jew. We took on anybody. I sat in prison here for a year for Soviet Jewry. I didn't ask, are they orthodox? Never, never asked. The cop movement has 80% of its voters who are non-Orthodox. But I tell them what they should be. And if you don't tell them what they should be, then they're not going to know what being Jewish is. When AFSI brought in William Bandhub, because he's a Christian friend of Israel, it didn't matter to them that this guy is one of the great missionaries inside inside Israel. The head of the head of the, the head of the Christian embassy. He tried to convert me. <laughs> he sat with me when he was the water of the garden tomb on Derek Shechem. And he sat with me because we had burned down three missionary buildings. And he said, Rabbi, you could be the Saint Paul of our time. <laughs> You think that because he is an asset to Zionism that I would invite him to a conference? He's as great a danger to the Jewish people as is, as is Arafat. Pardon? Richard Talmud, the lawyer who wants to be in the city. Yeah. Richard Talmud, the lawyer who wants to be in the city. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. So, oh, I'll take any Christian, any Christian. I'm not against Anuvan because he is a Christian. Of course not. He's a missionary. He's a missionary. And that doesn't bother you. It bothers me tremendously. Our great-grandparents went to the stake and died at the uh, funeral pyre to be Jewish and not become Christian. And I have a state of Israel that when I presented an anti-missionary bill, it was ruled a racist bill? What, are we crazy? What, are we insane? There isn't an old today in Israel that doesn't have missionaries in it. It's not an absorption center that, that hasn't got missionaries in it. And we allow this is freedom, democracy, to hell with that. You're a good Jew, and stay that way, and never become worse, but try to become better. Go <laughs> on, right ahead. But there's a long, a, a long line. There's a long line. Right. I would really appreciate it. one of the things that they do to me is they don't let me speak. Let a person whose view is different speak. Go on. You're absolutely right. I didn't mention AFSI in my in my whole speech. He got up, he mentioned AFSI. So I spoke about AFSI. You got up now and you mentioned the Tory Congress. So now I'll speak to them about them. Now listen to me. Of course they're a tragedy to the Jewish people. Of course they are. Anyone who will sit and attack Israel and sit in a, a cabinet with Arafat is a traitor to the uh, Jewish people, even if he has payers. Of course he's a traitor. If you see what they write about me, then you'll know what I say about them. But what does that have to, have to do with this? You mentioned Goldman. The reason why Peter Goldman divorced his, his wife was because I wrote two articles against Peter Goldman in the Jewish press. And he, because he is a saint, he's a saint, he divorced his wife. And he loved her. And he divorced her because he's a tremendous Jew and, and I want to sit next to him in Gan Eden. <laughs> and having become affiliated with Kaf, when he was honored by Kaf in Washington, AFSI sent out letters to, to their members stating that this was not being sponsored or recognized by AFSI. I don't want to get into an attack on AFSI. AFSI is a fine... Ex, 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 excuse, ex, excuse me, moment. Listen, this is not the Knesset. <laughs> People speak when they raise their hands. In between then, I speak. I'm now speaking. Now, no, no, I'm speaking. I'm speaking. AFSI is a wonderful group. 
FC is probably the best group in this country next next to Cal. I mean, it really. It's a good group. It understands things. But it doesn't understand enough. It's not enough to say, well, they're better than they are. You have to be the best. 